And I'm here with Mark Martell. How are you doing today, Mark? I'm fantastic. How are you, Rich? Pretty good. Now, are you in? Uh, you're. I, I thought I read you're a Nashville resident. I am. I've been here for uh, 16 years, but I'm a Canadian at heart. Canadian. Yeah, I I went to Nashville for the first time ever last year, and I'm I'm going back next month. I loved it. Loved it there. It's a beautiful town. I love it. Uh, it's actually the longest I've ever lived in one town, and it's it's really home. Nice. Now, uh, the first thing I want to get to is obviously what you're mainly known for, which is the Queen, the queen Extravaganza. Um, the I, Cream I, Extravaganza. The, the Cream extra. <laughs> yeah. You're doing Cream. You're doing Eric Clapton. You're not doing Freddie Mercury. Uh, uh, Eric Clapton. <laughs> now, I remember the first time I saw your uh, the audition video. I was actually just showing it to my kids uh, yesterday because... Uh, they know I'm doing this podcast, and I, I mentioned you, and they were like, "Well, who's that?" And I showed them the video, and they were like, "They and they love Queen." Yeah, you know, they're 14 and 11, and they love Queen, and uh, they were listening to it. They saw you singing, and they were listening to it, and they were they were kind of looking at me funny, like that sounds like he's just lip syncing to. <laughs> I'm like, no, that's that's really him. So I put on another uh, when you're on American Idol. I put that on, and they're like, they like they just couldn't believe it so well, your kids just paid me the highest compliment <laughs> tell thank you very much. yeah they i think they're going to start checking out more of your videos too and some of your uh your solo stuff which we'll get into um so how that that was like back in 2012 right if i'm not mistaken uh, that video is actually 2011 okay september and, but 2012 is when you started with the queen extravaganza yeah there. well the uh that's this 2012 is when we started touring, uh, okay. April, May 2012. But the whole like the whole contest of the, that video you saw, yep. that whole uh, audition process happened in late 2011, and the Ellen Show and <laughs> meeting Roger Taylor and all that stuff. That's pretty crazy. Yeah, that's. Uh... I forgot about the Ellen show, which I'm gonna to have to show them that too because they they love they love <laughs> Ellen. Uh, so now, how did like how did you get contacted? I I know you put the video up and like within days it was it just went crazy. Yeah, well, uh, the story goes: uh, a friend of mine, engineer, mixing engineer here in town, uh, just emailed me one day, and all it said, all the email was was in the uh, subject line. It said a must dot dot dot, and then in the body, all it was was a link to this website I'd never heard of before, and it was queenextravaganza.com, and I click on it, and uh, I, immediately it's like, okay, this is some kind of queen thing. You know, my first reaction is like, it's probably kind of corny and cheesy, and uh, and I noticed after reading just a little bit, it's like, whoa, this is this is Roger Taylor of yeah, Queen yeah. is on. And so I thought about it for, you know, a few days and uh I hemmed and haw over it and because I was I was in a band at the time. We were doing very well. You know, we had a bus and you know, we were, you know, doing well for ourselves. Uh <clears throat> but it was just starting to sort of slow down and and uh, I'd already been at the back of my mind thinking, you oh, know, what's next, you know? Um, and so I submitted my audition with somebody to love, and it immediately, like, within hours went viral. It was yep. it was nuts. So now, after you did the audition, how long did it take before you were actually talking to someone with Queen, whether it was management or, you know, Roger <clears throat> or Brian directly? Uh, so we, I actually, the final, um, audition contestants, um, got to meet Roger at, so the, the third audition happened at the Foo Fighters studio in LA yep. and, uh, Roger showed up with his team, Spike Edney. Um, I believe maybe even Jim beach was there. I can't remember. <clears throat> and, um, that was my first time meeting him and everyone was super nervous that, that he was there and. Um, but he's a super lovely guy. You know, yeah. obviously I consider him a friend now. We've, we've hung out quite a bit and, uh, nice. great guy. Uh, now <clears throat> you, you mentioned, uh, the band that you were in, you know, prior to this, it was slowing down. Uh, it's called down here. Is that, yes, that's correct. Uh, do you, yeah. did that band, do you have any, is there a discography for that band or is it, was it more of a, like a localized no, we we were in the CCM industry. we you know consider ourselves a Christian rock band, mm -hmm. and um, we released six or seven full-length studio albums, uh, 
three or four side projects, B-sides, what have you. Uh, now, we, we went hard for 13 years wow. and um, had moderate radio success in the CCM industry, Christian contemporary music. Mm-hmm. Um, and, um, yeah, we, when, our, when our sixth, our last studio album released, um, we released a, radio, a single to radio, as we always, we always did. We were on a record label and all that. And, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> It was uh, it was a song that I'd written. I felt like it was probably the best song I'd ever written, and I was like, man, even the, my my record label was saying, if we don't go number one with this, we need to all go, go back to school. And I was like, yeah, it's gonna be awesome. Uh, and the rate the the single uh, got picked up by a bunch of radio stations, like the most radio stations we'd ever had. And then a month later, it started dropping like flies. Uh, it just wasn't connecting with with the audience. And um, so I was like, man, if if this doesn't connect with with our audience, what are we doing? You know, I, so maybe I do need to go back to school. <laughs> <laughs> that was right around the time that the Queen thing started. So well, there you go. It, it something. It, everything happens for a reason, right? Mm-hmm. Now, uh, I want to go to the American Idol um, thing that you did. I, I I wasn't a huge fan of American Idol just because I I believe in um I believe in artists kind of paying their dues and and a lot of a lot of the the contestants on that you know probably have but I saw I I just happened to I had heard about the Queen thing going on on that and you know being a huge fan of Queen so I I yeah. tuned in oh and yeah it, it was it, it was crazy it was it was just so good and when when Brian and and Roger came out you know I thought I believe you first were playing with the the house band uh I, no it was all our own it band was, oh it was oh, that's yeah. right it was your it was your band for the queen extravaganza but then they came out and later Roger on run in yeah the end of the song, yeah, yeah, yeah. I've, I've been telling people if you haven't seen that actually i've been telling people if you haven't seen your audition uh video to go <laughs> to go watch it because it's just it's crazy uh now as far as singing did you um do you ever take vocal lessons when you were younger or is it just something that was natural to you uh my my mom is uh still to this day the piano player choir director in in my dad's church that he he's the pastor at and uh so uh, from from a very young age i got a, an ear for music and she would actually play us to uh, us kids i'm the oldest of three She'd play us to sleep on the piano. She'd play classical music uh, as we're going to sleep, and uh, I remember vividly the Moonlight Sonata by Beethoven and the just the work she was doing with her left hand. And I know I had small hands at the time, and I was like, "Man, how do you how do you make that rich, full sound?" So I've always had a very inquisitive, analytical mind when it comes to music, and so I took eight years of piano lessons. Um, and, uh, so piano is my first instrument. And then I taught myself guitar at the age of 14 when I started to write my own music, but I never took uh, vocal lessons. My vocal lessons were just using my ear and listening to great singers on the radio and going, how are they doing that? And I'd spend hours and hours just trying to mimic that sound. Um, and I've had multiple voice coaches come up to me, you know, after concerts saying, you're, you're using your voice correctly. I don't know how you just figure that out, that out on your own. But I think I think what it comes down to is uh, listen to your body. If it hurts, don't do it. <laughs> yeah, I have that problem trying to sing. Yeah. <laughs> I, I know I'm not, I know I'm not singing correctly when I do, but hey, it is what it is. Um, and that's cool about guitar too, because I taught myself guitar. And uh, I wanted to ask you. I noticed you had posted this. Uh, I can't remember if it was on Facebook or Instagram, or maybe both. Your you have a a guitar that's your baby and the headstock. <laughs> Take yeah. take me to and it, and it looks great now. It got repaired finally. Yeah. So what what just so the people that are listening, what kind of guitar was it? What happened? And I thought I read that you you had tried to repair it yourself. Yeah. First, oh you have it with you. Okay. Just so uh, people know that this will be the video will be on uh, YouTube a few days after the uh, podcast goes to post. There it, it is. is right. Uh, it's my beloved Gibson Advanced Jumbo. Nice, nice. And uh, they made the headstock to look like back in the 50s. And uh, <clears throat> I have two lovely cats, and uh, <laughs> my mystery-solving skills tell me that uh, guitars don't fall down on them on their own when they're in guitar stands, typically. And so uh, I didn't see I assumed that one of my cats knocked it over. And this had a huge crack, yeah. and I repaired it with uh, 
you know, I went online immediately. I was like, man, this is going to be an expensive repair. I'm pretty good at DIY, so I tried to repair it, repair it myself and did the old wood glue and C-clamp and let it dry for two weeks. And it held up pretty good for, uh, I don't know, three or four months. Oh. And then uh, just two weekends ago, we played an outdoor show at the uh, at Churchill Downs in Kentucky for the one of the derby parties. And it was 80 degrees, man. And uh, I think that glue just didn't hold up. Yeah. And I turned around to pick up my guitar for one song, and the headstock is snapped back. Yeah, I'm I, like, oh. I, saw, I saw the picture, and I was like, oh, no. <laughs> but then it, you, then you had the AB. You had the, the broken, yeah. then you had it fixed. And I was like, oh, you know, thank God. That, yeah. That and was- then, uh, so I took it to the pros here in town, Glazer Instruments. And I, I can't believe it. It looks like new, as you yeah. can see. Um, it's uh, yeah, amazing. Props it, to those guys. It doesn't look like there's any kind of crack anywhere in that in that wood. I didn't even know it was possible. So there you go. Well, it, it's recently I, I have a uh, I have an Ernie Ball Music Man, one of the Van Halen models from the the early '90s, and yeah. I pl- I played the hell out of that guitar for like 20 years. It was the only guitar I used, yeah. and it was it was just beat to hell. And the frets, there was actual dents in the frets in the wood. So I finally, after five years of it just sitting, I, I took it to a local guy here and I got it back within, you know, probably like a month. And same thing with with your guitar. It looks, I can't even tell that there were any indentations. And in like, it was mostly like on a D chord, like a chord that you play a lot. Yeah. was a little little divot in yep. there and it's gone. And it's, it's the work these guys do. It's like, I don't have the patience for it. Just the fact, that, well, just the fact that you you took the you know the initiative first to try to repair it. it I that's that's not me. Yeah, I would have thrown the guitar out the window, but <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad to see that it's uh, you know it's back in shape. Yeah. Uh, it's it's actually the, I I maybe have tried to fix it, but it's actually my favorite. It's it's the best acoustic guitar I've ever owned, and so I was like, ah, yeah. I got to fix it anyway. Now let's go on to your your solo <laughs> stuff. Uh, your album, I was looking on your website the other day, and uh, well, first of all, you have a few albums. Um, there's yeah. a, I believe there's a Christmas themed one, and then yep. you have the one I wanted to get into more was Impersonator. Yeah, um, absolutely. Now, what year did that come out? Was that brand new? That's not brand new. That's uh, it's uh, I think 2015, 15, 14. Yeah. Man, I, I, I can't remember anymore. <laughs> and you recorded that in Los Angeles. Uh, yes, with a fantastic producer, John Fields. Mm-hmm. Um, he produced one of my favorite albums of all time, The Beautiful Letdown by Switchfoot. Mm-hmm. And um, so immediately when I heard that I had the ch- chance, I was like, yes, call him, yeah. make it happen. I, I want to work with this guy. And so um, I spent, uh, I don't know, a couple months going in and out of L.A. working with with John, and um, he's such a talented musician, not only recording engineer, producer, but he plays, he's an amazing bass player, uh, guitar, programming, keys, whatever. And between the two of us, we can pretty much cover all, he's actually a decent drummer too, so he's he's actually playing some of the drums on the record. There's only a couple songs where you had to hire a guy. but uh, it was such a fun process. And it was the first time that I'd ever written songs in the studio, in the recording process. And so what we would do, which I think, I guess this is a fairly common thing for artists to do, but I'd yeah. never done it before. You you bring in what they call a top liner, someone to help you write the lyric and the melody and all that mm-hmm. stuff. And uh, and meanwhile, John is working like a madman at his computer with his Pro Tools magic happen while we're in the other room coming up with lyrics and song themes and stuff and uh it was a really synergistic uh exercise it was really fun i'm super proud of this record uh impersonator it's uh it's actually it's definitely the most personal album i've ever done um a lot of it uh covers you know dealing with being an artist and also being compared to this other artist um and just kind of coming to terms with that and uh you know my identity and all that stuff um and there's some love songs in there obviously because i am in love but uh <laughs> it's uh it's i i think it still holds up uh, two three years later man i cannot remember what year we released that anyway but uh i, I really think it's still got some life in it um it just hasn't really gotten out there yet, but it's still available. And I, please... yeah, I plan on uh, getting a copy of it. Um, you know, so as soon as we we set up the interview and, and the uh, for those for those of you who don't get 
Canadian, British, subtle, sarcastic humor. The title is Tongue in Cheek. Yeah. Impersonator. I yeah. Fi- yeah, I figured that. Well, I I saw another video that you had done. Um, it was with a radio station, and then they had they had you singing all different styles. You know, there yeah. was there was Bon Jovi. I'm in a Bon Jovi tribute band, so that was cool to see that. Uh, there was uh, what was the other one? There was a few. Uh, Journey. There was Journey. Yeah. I don't do a great uh, Steve Perry. Well, nobody does. <laughs> uh, <laughs> he's he's more raspy than yeah. than. Uh, could get to yeah you so have a you have a yeah. smooth a very smooth voice which is cool well, so can, he, yeah. but you can get raspy too i you know i heard it on uh watching some of the queen stuff you can uh you get you you put it where it needs to be which is which is very cool um now impersonator uh is that that's a, obviously it's available through your website which is mark uh is that a bit i'm guessing it's on itunes and is it available? Yes. Uh, is it actual CD available, like on Amazon, or is it just download? Or uh, you can uh, you can order it on my website, the, the, uh, the actual hard copy. If okay. you're into that, yeah, I know there's a lot of people that diss the the MP3 and all that stuff. They want I I like actual vinyl, so I don't know. I'm, yeah, I'm... <laughs> I would love to do vinyl. I actually don't even own a record player. But, I just uh, bought one recently. You know. It, it, what do what do you get? Because I I'm a bit of an audiophile. I don't want to get a piece of crap. I didn't. Um, yeah, I didn't. I didn't really go crazy because it's like you said. It, it's not easy to find a, a really good one. I I just went to a, it was a local store here, just like a, yeah. a big chain store, and they had a they had one that actually had a CD player built in. It had a FM AM radio. You could plug your MP3 player into it, and then it had the turntable on top. So with the speakers built into it. So I just said, yeah. you know what. It was like eighty bucks. I was like, "Screw it! I'm just gonna get that." Yeah, I figure if I'm gonna get a record player, it's yeah. gonna be because there's something that vinyl offers sonically that CDs don't. There's some yeah. kind of a 3D uh, dynamic thing that happens there, and I think you need like a super hi-fi yeah. system to even hear that stuff. So I'm gonna stick to CDs until I can afford <laughs> that. <laughs> something. I'm right with you on that. Yeah. Uh, now, as far as uh, your touring, do you ever get up uh, the Queen show? Does it ever get up to? I'm in the Northeast. I'm in Rhode Island. Does it ever yeah. get up this way? I know you're going to Pennsylvania. I yeah. thought I saw. Well, so we're building this new thing called the Ultimate Queen Celebration with uh, this new promoter who's mm-hmm. based out of Manhattan, and um, it's really quickly gathering steam. Like you said, we're playing we're playing a couple shows in Pennsylvania coming up. Uh, we are, I believe, playing. Atlantic City no. um, sometime this year. I, I couldn't tell you. I, I can grab my iCal and see if it's on my calendar yet. I thought I saw some Canada dates, too. Yeah, um, we've yeah. got uh, Quebec, maybe Toronto. I think we're working on Vancouver. Mm-hmm. It's all happening, man. <laughs> I'm I'm looking at my iCal right now, and I'm looking for um, anything that... So how, how far would Atlantic City be for you? It's probably about a five-hour drive. Oh, never yeah. mind. Okay. <laughs> well, that's why I'm asking. I lo- I love this. I know there's a lot of people up, you know, up my way here in New England that would love to see that show, and it's just it doesn't seem to get close enough for us. Well, man, I just have a little patience. I think I yeah. think we're gonna come near you sometime. Yeah. The, the whole thing is is that I love I love the playing with the Queen Extravaganza. Mm-hmm. There's no higher quality musicianship show that I've ever been a part of. Um, they do it so well as far as the spectacle goes. The been incredible um uh but <clears throat> they we aren't touring um this year uh so there's been uh still a demand for me to go out and play queen stuff so i'm like well i gotta i gotta gotta work <laughs> so well, you, you have i know you have a bunch of uh, solo dates yep coming up too and a lot of i noticed a lot of private events which is cool yeah i've been playing a lot of private events it's been really really great um but i'd, I'd also like to put some you know, do some shows where the public feels like invited. Right, right. <laughs> now, when you do your solo shows, it do you do like a mix of Queen stuff and in your own your own music, or is it? It all depends on usually, what they want. Yeah, yeah. Usually, solo shows are kind of a custom job. It's mm-hmm. like, well, we like you for your Queen stuff, or we like you for your Christian stuff, or we like you for whatever. You know. Um, so usually, it's like, well, what do you want? I'll give you a mix of everything I do. I'll do a little bit of opera. You know, do a little bit of Weird Al Yankovic. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> it's uh, it's pretty. It's those shows are always different uh, according to what they need. So I'm happy to serve. 
Yeah, definitely. Uh, I'm going to keep an eye on things because uh, I, I got, I've got to see it. I've never seen Queen live, which sucks, but I guess you well, guys are an aspect thing. Yeah, Lambert. Lambert, yeah. Lambert, Lambert, yeah. Uh, an incredible, incredible singer. I was actually mentioning uh, American Idol earlier, but uh, I I was actually, uh, I watched a few seasons of, of American Idol all the way through, and including the one he was on, yep. and I can't believe he didn't win. I mean, yeah. I'm guessing there's maybe some political stuff involved. Uh, who knows what goes on behind the scenes, but um, I was a huge fan of his. Uh, still am, obviously, mm-hmm. but uh, I mean, he's so creative with the covers he did on the show, and uh, I think today there's probably no, like, technically no better male singer out there. I mean, he just lives. Yeah, he's in, up. He's up the there. <laughs> above where, where mine is, and uh, with ease, you know. Mm-hmm. So, uh, props. Yeah, the whole thing with American Idol, like I was saying before, like I I saw the whole season with Daughtry, and I thought I thought he was the best one on that season, but yeah. I don't know if he was a little too rock at the time for that for that show. Maybe it was probably around the right. It was right around the time I remember that season yeah. where Rock was starting to do this. Yeah, yeah. No, they're the coming. Rock. They're coming back though. They're going to ABC. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so. Well, cool. Let's uh, let's wrap this up now. Is there anything sure. else that you want to uh, get out there for the listeners? Uh, anybody that's never heard of you, which they're going to hear of you after this, um, whether Absolutely. it be uh, whatever you want to put out there. Yeah, like, like I mentioned, the Ultimate Queen celebration is gathering speed. Uh, keep up with us on my Facebook page, Mark Martell Music, and uh, yeah. there's also Mark Mark Martell Music uh, dot com. And uh, another thing, this summer I'm uh, pretty much going to be in the studio most of the time working on two EPs. So last year we had a Christmas EP called The Silent Night EP, and it was actually surprisingly really successful. Uh, We had a really good run at radio with one of the tunes on that one, and so we're doing a follow-up EP to that, yet to be titled. Um, So I'm releasing another Christmas EP this year, and also a covers EP, which people have been asking for for quite a while. And uh, I actually asked on my Facebook page uh, for everyone just to give me ideas for what songs to cover, because I didn't grow up listening to really cool music. So, on it, like I, I was never into to Bowie. I wasn't even into Queen when I was. A you kid. don't. You don't even want to know what I grew up listening to. <laughs> I, I, I'm a latecomer. Like I, I my last uh, podcast, I was talking to. Um... Who, uh, yesterday it was Mark Scott from the band Trickster. I don't know if you remember Trickster from the '80s. Okay. And uh, I sat. I started out playing on drums, and mm-hmm. it, it, my my house, uh, my parents, um, my mother mainly would, would listen to like Barry Manilow, and disco. So I never got the rock thing. So I started playing drums. I took lessons. And when I was 12 years old, I discovered Van Halen, and I was like, okay, no more drums. I'm teaching okay. myself guitar, and that it went from there. So. I, I know what you're saying, like not having that type of music around earlier. Yeah, um, the, the the stuff I, I listened to growing up definitely was meaningful and very formative. You know, a well, lot. It shaped you, helped shape you. Shapes you. A lot yeah. of it has to do with what your parents are listening to. Um, but uh, yeah, so I, I'm still discovering great music from yeah. the '70s and '80s, and so people um, gave me a bunch of uh, ideas, and I got about 300 song ideas to do for my cover covers record, and it's like, well, guys, I you know I got to do pick six, you know. <laughs> so what I'm doing is I'm choosing six songs that uh, are meaningful to me because they remind me of someone in my life, mm-hmm. whether it's someone in my life who introduced me to an artist that I really love their music the song itself reminds me of something about something about a person or a quality that someone has that I really admire so um, it's music that's uh, that reminds me of people in my, in my life so I'm still working on choosing the songs uh, I'm gonna actually start with uh, we're going to the studio next week and we're just starting and I think I'm gonna start with my way by Frank Sinatra oh, cool. uh, and uh, so that'll that'll be interesting I haven't really done any crooner yet so we'll see how that turns out <laughs> well I, I before i let you go i did i did one thing i did want to ask you and i just remembered uh i saw you posting about abbey road yeah what was going on with that you were in london are you, are you a huge beatles fan i'm not a huge beatles fan but i you know everybody knows abbey everybody. road and yeah if if you don't appreciate the Beatles, I have no time for you. No, I, I appreciate. It. Actually, my old my old original band back in the '90s, our first CD, we did a cover of "Let It Be." So, yeah. Uh, I mean, some people actually don't like the Beatles. 
Yeah. Oh, <laughs> they, they all they, oh. Yeah, it's crazy. Oh, they, yeah. three chords, three chords. Yeah, but it's the way they move those three chords around and put melodies over them, it's it's not easy. <laughs> I, I could see you not actually liking the music, but there's, there's so much to... Anyway, I'm not going to yeah. get into that. <laughs> anyway, it was just amazing to be at Abbey Road. Um, even for me, who's a moderate Beatles fan, they took me into uh, Studio 2, which is the one where they did all their work. There's mm -hmm. three or four studios in Abbey Road. Yep. The number one is where it's just basically a big gymnasium where they do orchestra stuff. And number two is where the Beatles essentially did all of their records except for Let It Be, I believe. And um, so, and I, I'd seen online or documentaries and stuff where they had shot this, you know, there's footage of them working in there. And I walked in and immediately I was like, whoa, <laughs> like chills. Um, and it still looks pretty much the same. Their pianos are still there. The ones that, you know, John Lennon played mm -hmm. day in the life, apparently. Um, and so I walked in there and just kind of soaked it all in, but I got to work in studio three, which is, is a more updated modern working studio. And the, it's pretty amazing because Abbey road is not, it's not what you'd think. It's not like a, like a museum or anything like right. that. It's a just a regular business it's a studio right. they're still making great records there today mm -hmm. uh so it was really amazing to to work in that studio even studio three is also you know great artists are still recording in and got to work with a great uh producer and, and team there so uh that was that was pretty cool pretty well, surreal what was it for uh, can you not say it's something i can't mention at this okay. time okay but uh, it will be evident in the following months to come <laughs> okay i'm gonna be watching for that i'm definitely gonna get your uh your cd well to download anyway probably of um, impersonator i urge people to check out mark mark martell music.com thank you so much for taking the time today uh my pleasure rich it's uh it's always you know the podcast for me it's, it's just a love of music and i just want to get as many people on here that i feel should be you know shown to the yeah. world so i appreciate you coming on Yes, man. Thanks for the great questions and uh good luck with the rest of your podcast days thanks uh, we'll keep in touch definitely all right, man. Take care. Take care. What a great story. Mark Martell of the Queen Extravaganza. You can check out everything going on with Mark at his official website, which is markmartellmusic.com. He spells it M-A-R-C-M-A-R-T-E-L music.com. Everything from his tour dates, his solo tour dates, the Queen stuff uh, is on the website. You can order one of his CDs. I ordered the latest one. I'm still waiting on it. Excited to listen to it once it arrives. If you're into the Christmas music Anything like that, he's got that there. There's some other swag for sale, I believe. Uh, photo gallery, everything. Everything you need to know about Mark is on his website, markmartellmusic.com. So thank you to Mark for coming on to the podcast. And again, the video will be going up a few days after this goes to post. Coming up next week, next Tuesday, which I said earlier in the podcast before we started with Mark, going to try to tick, stick to a Tuesday schedule when putting these out. Uh, it should be Jason Wade of Lifehouse, which should be very cool. Uh, that will be just a phone interview. So look for that next week. Uh, check out the com. Go back and listen to all the other previous episodes. Had some great guests. Have some really good guests coming up too in the future. If you know of anybody that you think might want to come on, again, let me know. You can email me at rockerdadpodcast at gmail.com. I'm on Instagram, I'm on Facebook, uh, Twitter, so just look up Rocker Dad Podcast and you should be able to find me. Again, thanks to Mark, thanks to you for listening. Please subscribe, subscribe, subscribe. Send this, share or everything, send it to all your friends, anybody that likes rock music, guitars, um, music gear, all that stuff. I try to talk about, I'll try to hit on some other subjects too as they come up, but so far, just concentrating on uh, going with music. So until next time, I will see you. Hey, I might see you. If you come to one of my shows, I might see you. So hopefully if you're in my area, you can come out to a show, say hi. And uh, until then, take care. <laughs>